Sociology should not be a politically correct science. Identities are not rational. Identities are buried in history. Identities are based on traumas. I think we need to look backward into history in order to understand traumas. What I'm presenting to you is a joint work by an Iranian sociologist and an Israeli sociologist trying to understand why we are in conflict with each other. Uh, and we provide a very different approach than what is common um, in, in political science, international relations. We both come from this Eliasian uh, approach of looking back in history, looking back at trauma, and uh, thinking carefully about why people today express the way they express themselves and what, what the trauma is that lies be, behind, beyond, underneath uh, the conflict between the two countries. So uh, I will be talking about the Iranian humiliation and the Israeli sense of being annihilated as two traumas. Here's my thesis. Um, and th that's where we differ, differ from geopolitical analysis, from international relations kinds of, kind of theories. Uh, we argue that there's, beyond the geopolitics, there's a conflict of traumas between the two countries. Um, just yesterday I saw some, some Israelis saying, uh, the Iranians made uh, us lose our country 2,400 years ago. So they count centuries and centuries and centuries back the relations between, you know, biblical times. And they have this biblical time in their head in thinking about the future, what's going to happen. We have a lesson in the Bible. Uh, so we'll speak about the conflict of the traumas where the Iranian is colonial humiliation. I'll try to show you that Iran suffers humiliation not just in... in what happens right now, but throughout the 20th century, 19th century, and even before. And I'll mostly speak about the Israeli side, uh, being an Israeli. I'll talk about the fear of annihilation. I'll make a few laps with you, but uh, this is a serious uh, matter. Here's the argument. Um, so we have two countries, Iran and Israel, who each has its own trauma. So the Iranian trauma of humiliation uh, stems from the Muslim occupation. I Iran is not an Arab country. It's a Persian country. They don't speak Arabic. They hate Arabs. This is the Saudi Arabia-Iran conflict. This is the Iraqi-Iranian conflict. It's a... Uh, it's a cultural conflict between Arabs and Persians. Um, so the Arab occupation, when, when Muhammad took Iran, is there in their mind, the Arab occupation, okay, getting rid of the Arabs. Uh, the Mongol occupation, 12th century, wiped Iran uh, out in running to Europe. Uh, they, they killed Iran, and uh, so they remember that. And 18th century colonialism taking over Iran. We'll have a few more words about that later. Um, so they have this history of humiliation by foreign powers. And for them to hold a bomb is to have a kind of salvation from a psychological sense of inferiority, of being colonized by external powers, Russia, England, United States, the UN, everybody's colonizing, everybody's taking our oil, our resources, um, we are humiliated. So having a bomb is saying to the world, you cannot touch us anymore. They will finally have the position where no one will, will be able to tell them what to do. So it's a kind of salvation army. It's a kind of salvation weapon. 
Uh, for the Israelis, on the other hand, uh, we culturally, when I say we, it's the, the culture of Israel, we hold um, the entire history of exile from um, first to Babylon, then to Rome, and then all, all over the world, and uh, being um, victims of different pogroms, Muslim world, Christian world, all over Europe, and obviously the Holocaust is a, is a major... If you were to come to a formal visit in Israel, you would be landing, after the airplane makes this quick turn around not to cross the Jordan, and the tour guide will say, if it's a formal visit, they would first take you to Yad Vashem, to the Israeli memorial for the Holocaust, and say to you, this is the center of our identity. And it is the center of our identity, okay? the Holocaust. And the sense that this will never happen again. Okay? Um, so for Israel, Iran having a bomb mounts to a second Holocaust. Because the Iranians are saying, we'll wipe Israel off the map. Now, the, whether they mean it or not, unclear. But for the Israelis, there's no joke. In that, because we had Holocaust one, they want Holocaust two. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, this is the trauma a bomb mounts the ho uh, Holocaust, and therefore there's no joking on either side. They're very serious. If the Israelis are pushing the Americans to sanction um, uh, Iran, they humiliate it. If the Iranians are saying we're going to have a bomb in order to stop the USA, Netanyahu is saying, well, they, they are aiming for a Holocaust. So it's a double bind. They are locked. Um, and it's very difficult to unlock the conflict situation. So this is the structure of the argument. And, and as said, there are other actors here. There's Saudi Arabia, there's the United States, there's the UN. We just focus in this presentation on these two. Okay? But it's a larger picture. And what happens in the larger picture is very relevant. Syria going down, Saudi Arabia going up, Bahrain, it's relevant. But for the cl cleanliness of the sociological analysis, we just focus on the trauma of both countries. So let me talk a few minutes about um, the layers of cultural trauma. Um, there are mythologies. Um, I'll speak about the Israeli case. Um, in Hebrew, we say, "Avarnu et paro navor We passed Pharaoh in Egypt three thousand years ago, four thousand years ago. We'll pass that too. So we have this biblical vision. They try to kill us. We will win. Eventually, we will win. So there's this, this myth that everybody is against us. Um, now, this myth, which is biblical, uh, has a long history of proof that the biblical saying that they will chase us repeats itself in history. And we have a lot of historical evidence to show that the Jews were persecuted uh, across the centuries. Um, so we have the myth, the founding document, we have historical cases like uh, the Holocaust, and then we have contemporary threats. So Iran is a contemporary threat. It says we are going to annihilate Israel. We are going to wipe Israel off the map. Um, here it is. So wipe Israel off the map. Uh, so it's a reminder. It plays out. When, when they say this, they get this. When they say this, right? And there's the sense that there are future risks. And whenever we think about the future and the sense that they are going to throw a bomb, it again uh, goes down all through the myth, reminds the myth, uh, and makes it uh, all more relevant again and again. So this happens for the Iranians, um, USA and Zionist entity masterminding the ongoing aggression. So the, the, the Iranian have a kind uh, of theory that everything that happens in Iran 
is masterminded by MI6 and the CIA. So if someone has a liberal voice in Iran, he's probably being paid by the CIA. They have a big suspicion about these colonial powers influencing what happens in Iran. And they have a long history to support that suspicion. Okay, we'll see in a minute. Okay, um, so because of the persistence of mythology, it's very difficult to uh, get rid um, um, of past traumas and just say, the situation right now is solvable and we'll solve it and, and history is past and gone. No, traumas are there to remain. So I bring just a few quotes from the leaders showing the sense of humiliation. The source for all our troubles, this is again Khomeini, is America. The source for all our troubles is America. The source for all our troubles is Israel. Israel belongs to America. Our parliament members belong to America too. America bought everybody. And this critique, I think it's 1963, was actually true. This is uh, uh, Khamenei, Ali Khamenei is the current leader. So he, he replaced Khomeini. Um, and he speaks about the humiliation. The Islamic Revolution, 1979, wiped out the oppression and the historical humiliation that was imposed on the Iranian nation and brought about national honor and freedom for the people of Iran. So he says, until 1979, we were humiliated for centuries, for centuries. This is Netanyahu, uh, March 2012. You know, he's, a, he's, a, he's very good at rhetorics. He knows to speak. So, uh, I didn't bring the entire video, but um, he makes this talk in Washington, D.C. for the IPAC. It's the Jewish community in uh, or lobby. And he speaks about Iran. He, he gets 30 minutes to talk everywhere. He speaks about Iran. Um, last, last Independence Day, he was intervi interviewed on television and he was asked, how do you want to be remembered? You know, he's the third time Prime Minister. What's your legacy? And he says, I want to be remembered as the defender of Israel. As the defender of Israel. So he stands up in 2012. And after 24 minutes speaking about the Iranians, he pulls out two letters stands like that for two minutes, saying this is the letter sent by the Jewish agency to the um, American War Department, asking the Americans to bomb the railway to Auschwitz to stop the German um, uh, killing machine. So that's the left-hand letter. The right-hand letter is the response by the American War uh, Department saying, ah, we are too busy. We don't have time, and we will only make the Germans more angry. And he says, more angry? More angry than the Holocaust? What, what could more they do? Um, and then he says, that's the basic Zionist position coming from Herzl. Never again. We will never let that happen again. So that's the habitus. That's the stand which every Israeli will say, hmm, yes, 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 I will vote for him. It took Hitler six years to kill six million Jews, and it will take Ahmadinejad only six minutes. It took Hitler six years, it will take Ahmadinejad six minutes. So you see the way the trauma works it in his mind. It's um, Hitler, and then it's Ahmadinejad. He plays out the Holocaust, first Holocaust, second Holocaust. is coming, and we have to stop it. This is why I make the movie. Okay? I have to stop Ahmadinejad. I have to convince the Israelis that something is going to happen to them.
Let me push the conclusions. I think each country has to understand its own traumas. Uh, and so the Israelis have to study their own trauma. The Iranians have to understand their own traumas. And then both sides need to come to the table and to acknowledge each other's fears. Um, and once I, as an Israeli, will say to an Iranian, I understand that you have a post-colonial trauma, that you were humiliated from 16th century, 12th centuries, 6th century, and again, 19th century and 20th century, and America is your biggest... Yes, uh, I acknowledge that, but please acknowledge my trauma too. As long as we do not do that, just as we and the Palestinians do not acknowledge each other's trauma, we cannot make negotiations futile. Uh, they are futile. They don't work because we ignore each other's. Um, and then we need to create a new narrative that will cut history. Because if we don't manage to get a new narrative on the table, and convince people that the past is not lo no longer relevant to, to the future, we are going to live in the past again. And we are going to live our fears again. So how, you know, how one goes in creating this kind of new narrative where Iran and Israel bypass their traumas and come uh, for a clean slate, for a new beginning, as Obama is urging us to do, I don't know. But that's, that's, the, uh, um, that's the challenge. Obama is making the right move towards Iran. But what I think he fails to acknowledge or to understand is that he speaks an American culture a very pragmatist orientation to a people that, rather than looks for the future, looks for the past. So he tells the Iranians, ignore the past. Let's just forget about it. That's an American position. And he fails to appreciate that he speaks in the wrong language, in the wrong culture, to a people which looks back into history and says, We've been humiliated. We need to fix that. So it's not easy to bypass the traumas of the past, as Obama is believing or as Europe is believing. The Middle East is looking back. And we need, in, in discussing future solutions, we need to understand how this looking back um, is changed by creating new narratives. And that's not an easy task. If you were to ask me, am I optimistic or pessimistic about the Israeli-Iranian, I'm not optimistic. Am I th fearing war? Not really. But it's not going to be a positive outcome. Both countries are going to remain stuck. Iran is going to be humiliated by the EU and the United States. Israel is going to be left with the fear that someone will hold an atomic weapon and be ready to throw it at Israel. Both sides, it's going to be frozen, I think, rather than solved. And I, I'm not optimistic to see solutions for such a long history of conflict.